Let's start the second half of class by um, quickly going over the example from the end of the last lecture, not lecture eight today, but the previous lecture, where we were looking at comparing two population means that have to do with prices of wheat per bushel. <coughs> Remind you of what went on here. There were two different samples, and they were assumed to be independent of each other. The first sample size was 32, the second sample size was 27. With two different sample means, X1 bar was $7.72 per bushel, and X2 bar was $7.54 per bushel, and two sample standard deviations, 25 cents per bushel for S1, though you'd want to write it as $0.25, and 31 cents per bushel for the second sample, though, you want to write it as 0.31. We were wondering, does, can you conclude from these data that the national mean prices, the population means, are different for July and August? Okay. Um, I'm going to show you the answer that we didn't quite have the time to get to last time. But let me just first show you the calculation of the standard error. <coughs> the standard error of the difference x1 bar minus x2 bar. And remind yourself what that means. That's supposed to be an estimate for the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. That's what these standard error, errors are typically. And it's the sampling distribution of that difference. Take these two statistics and subtract them, and you get one variable that that one variable has a sampling distribution that looks like a normal curve. This formula is square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. You technically can, on um, most calculators, sort of do this all at once. However, for the purposes of showing your work and helping me or the grader find any mistakes and give you more partial credit, than you would get if you just wrote down an answer. You probably should figure out what each piece is. For example, what's S1 squared? That is 0.25 squared. Write that down. Divide that by N1 means divide by 32. Write that down. Do the same kind of thing for S2 squared and divide it by N2. I guess I will go ahead and do that all at once here. 0.31 squared divided by 27. That's S2 squared. Look on the screen there in two spots. S2 is 0.31. N2 is 27. S2 squared divided by 27 is this. So at a minimum, you should show those two numbers as what you're adding underneath the square root. <coughs> Point zero zero one nine five three one two five. That's what the first fraction equals. Plus point zero zero three five five nine two five nine three. That's what the second fraction equals. You you maybe should even show more than that. You should show the the first step of how you plug the numbers in. Um, I think it is a good idea to show all the decimal places that your calculator gives you and write them all down because the errors will build up if you round too soon. Just round at the end. Anyway, add these numbers up. So I'm adding those two numbers now to get that. That's the thing I take the square root of. Raise it to the 0.5 power. The standard error is about 0 0.0742. Even there, I'd probably keep more decimal places than that, though. 0 0.0742454. Go ahead and write them all, I guess. That's more significant digits than you'd ever report. However, again, until the, don't round until the very end. We want to multiply that for the confidence interval by, by t star. What's t star? Go to the t table. 
We're using 26 degrees of freedom, right? That's the smaller of 32 minus 1 and 27 minus 1. Go to the t-table. Twenty. What did we say? Twenty-six degrees of freedom. Ninety-five percent confidence. Twenty-six degrees of freedom turns out to be right there. It's two point zero five six. You can't quite see it. T star is two point zero five six. So that's what we multiply the standard error by to get the margin of error. 0.15 now round, maybe 0.153. And that would be in dollars. 0.153 dollars would be our margin of error. The confidence interval could be written like this. It doesn't contain zero. That's the most important thing about it. It's all positive numbers. So we've got good evidence based on this confidence interval that the mean prices are different. In fact, for a two-tailed test, that the mean prices are the same, since that's a 95% confidence interval and it does not contain zero, we know that for a two-tailed test, our result is statistically significant at the 5% level. If we calculated the p-value, which I'm not going to bother doing, maybe next time. I want, to do other things, I want to do other things still today. If we calculated the p-value for the test, we'd get a p-value smaller than 5% because this interval does not contain zero. It seems that, indeed, the mean prices during July, which is the first one, are greater than the mean prices during August, not just for the samples, but also for the population. We've got strong evidence against the null that they're the null assumption that they're the same. Statistically significant evidence at the five percent level. Reject the null. All right, new topic. Chapter eight, new chapter. Now we're going to be focused on proportions rather than means. Proportions, ratios, fractions, percentages between zero and one as proportions or between zero percent and 100 percent as percents. Actually, proportions can be thought of as means if you view them in a certain way, special way, but we're not going to do that. We are going to think them of them as fractions, ratios, typically write them as between 0 and 1, and typically write them without a percent sign. Though you should always be able to convert it to a percent if you are asked to. Here's our example. As part of a quality improvement program, we considered an example like this before, your internet order company is studying the process of filling customer orders. According to co co company standards, an order is shipped on time if it is sent within one day of the time it is received. You select a simple random sample of 200 orders from the past month for an audit, and the audit reveals that 164 of these orders were shipped on time. Now, really, with internet companies and, well, Robot workers, say, filling these orders, they re really it should be 100% shipped on time. But, oh well, we'll go with what we have here. Three things to do. Find a 95% confidence interval to estimate the true proportion of the um, month's orders that were shipped on time. 95% confidence interval to estimate the true proportion, population proportion, of the month's orders that were shipped on time. Second question, how big a sample size n would be required to get co the confidence interval to have a margin of error of 1% or less? Um, as a decimal, that would be a proportion of 0.01 or less. 
And C, do you have statistically significant evidence that the true population proportion is greater than 75%? Actually, I didn't take the time to go through the calculations of this before class. It's possible that when we answer part A, we could already be at a margin of error of 1% or less. I didn't check to see if that happened or not. My hunch is no, but we'll see. All right. So what's your parameter? We're going to call it P. We're not going to use a Greek letter here. We're going to call it just a plain P. That's going to be the population proportion of orders shipped on time. Maybe during a certain month. Okay? That's the parameter from the population you'd like to estimate. What would be a symbol, a logical symbol that we've used before for something that would be a good estimator of this, a good point estimate? A P was something else. Here's again. P hat. That's going to be the sample proportion. of order shift on time. For your sample, hopefully a simple random sample. <coughs> yeah, that's what we're assuming. Got the numbers right there, 164 out of 200. That's the fraction. 164 <coughs> out of 200, that's what that sample proportion equals. The book writes it as a, an abstract formula as x over n, where n is clearly the sample size, 200 in this case. x is the number that were shipped on time. I guess you could call those number of successes. x would have a binomial distribution, actually. Counting the number of successes, the number of orders that are shipped on time for a fixed number of trials n. X would really have a binomial distribution, but for the proportion, we compute the fraction. You could think of it as a probability of being shipped on time. As a decimal, this is 0.82. That's how you can leave your final answer for your point estimate. But it's, it's a point estimate. It's not an interval estimate. Now we want an interval estimate. We want to broaden this one point to an interval. So we do the same thing as always. We do an estimate plus or minus margin of error. This is what we always do, actually. In some other situations, you don't always do this. But what we always do is this. What's your point estimate? Again, it's p hat. What's your margin of error? Again, it's a special number with a star times the standard error. In chapter 8, guess what? Fun, fun, fun. We go back to z. Times a standard error of what? How about a standard error of p hat, the sampling distribution, an estimate for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of p hat? Does that make logical sense? It's the same kind of pattern. Estimate plus or minus margin of error. The margin of error is always a special number times something else. That something else in chapter 6 was a standard deviation of a sampling distribution for x bar. In chapter 7, it was a standard error, an estimate for a standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Use S instead of sigma. And we also expanded it to two populations and two samples. In chapter 8, now we're doing proportions. It's a standard error for the sample proportion. So P hat's got a sampling distribution. Its value varies from sample to sample. It really is a random variable. The sampling distribution models the behavior of that random variable. But that now begs the question, what is that standard error? <coughs> Can you see that back there? Is that bright enough? Is this in the way here? Video? What is that standard error? It's the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat divided by n. That's what it is. 
Where did that come from? Well, it's sort of a little modification of the standard deviation of a binomial standard deviation. I don't know if you remember this. I did, I did mention it. We didn't really focus on it much. When you had a binomial random variable, well, we did focus on the formula for the mean. If x is binomial, binomial with parameters n and p, n being the number of trials and p being the probability of success, we said the mean of x was n times p. And that made good logical sense, and we definitely talked about that, but that a fair amount. I said the standard deviation of x was the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. We did use that when we used a normal approximation to a binomial, and you had some homework problems where you used this. This formula for the standard error is kind of similar to that. Instead of a p, you have a p hat p hat times 1 minus p hat. And instead of the n in the top, there's an n in the bottom. Well, the n in the bottom basically comes because you're dividing by n there. The square root's still the same, you still have the square root. So it's, it's related to that equation. I, didn't, I never explained where this equation came from because it's just beyond the scope of this course to explain that equation. But this one is definitely related to that. So now let's calculate the answer. There's our point estimate, 0.82. I should probably throw this pen away, it looks like. Rim shot. Oh. I am terrible at throwing away things by throwing them. That's why I never got past a couple of years in basketball. Pretty good at dribbling and passing, not so good at shooting. <laughs> All right, um, we want a 95% confidence interval. Z star, not T star. You don't have to worry about degrees of freedom here. It's not relevant. For chapter 8 problems for proportions. The normal distribution gives a good enough, good enough answers. Actually, the normal's not perfect either because P hat is really discrete for a fixed N. But we don't worry about that. We use a normal approximation. 95%, hopefully you recall that Z star is going to be 1.96. Our old friend. All right, let's calculate this. What's the standard error? Point 0.82 is the sample proportion. That's the P hat. Show your work like this. I'm typing it. You could just write this down. You need to multiply those. 0 0.82 times 0 0.18. You could also just type a 0.18 instead. Is that? You write that down. Divide by n is divide by 200 in this case. You're going to get a pretty small number. Sometimes it might even be in scientific notation. Yep. <coughs> 7.3e negative 4 means 7.38 times 10 to the negative 4, which really means 0 0.000738. Move the dec decimal point to the left for four spots. That's the. Um, the thing under the square root. Now take its square root to get the standard error. Raise it to the 0.5 power. The standard error is about 0 0.027. Now multiply that times 1.96. Your margin of error is now about 0 0.053. So our answer for the confidence interval is 0.82 plus or minus 0.053. I'll go ahead and round to one more place of accuracy. A little bit more precision. I'm not, that's not necessarily the best thing to do in real life. It's, in real life, it's good to uh, round them to the same precision, in this case, the 100 spot. But I like doing it one more spot. 
There is your confidence interval for the um, proportion. In interval notation, it's 0 0.767, comma 0.873. Is that right? That's right, I believe. Okay. What does it tell you? We're 95% we're confident that the true proportion of our um, orders that are filled on time is between these two proportions. As percentages, 76.7% and 87.3%. Put the percent sign if you write them like that. And yeah, the margin of error is bigger than 1%. It's 5.3%. So B is not, you know, already taken care of. We, there is something to do for part B still here. Be looking that over, maybe checking the calculation on your calculator, making sure you get the same thing. On test, the thing that people have the hardest time with is deciding what formulas to use in all this. Is this a mean or is it a proportion? That's one thing you should ask yourself. Is it one sample or two samples based on one population or two populations? That's another thing you should ask yourself when you're trying to decide what formulas to use. How big a sample size do you need? for the margin of error. M is Z star times the square root of P hat times 1 minus P hat over N. Part B, we want to know how big should N be to make the margin of error, M in this case, 0 0.01 or less. I'm going to go ahead and solve this equation for N. Though keep in mind, if you are in the planning stages of things and you haven't done any sampling, that you don't know what p hat is yet. <coughs> Let's go ahead and solve it for n anyway. Here's some algebra. Here's another place where algebra comes into play. Solve this equation for n. Square both sides to get rid of that square root. m squared equals z star squared times p hat times 1 minus p hat over m. The square root goes away. Trying to solve for n, I can take this equation and multiply both sides by n and also divide both sides by m squared. Multiply both sides by n and divide both sides by m squared. If I do it to one side, I've got to do it to the other. So that the n's cancel on this side, the m squared's cancel on this side, I'm left with n equals, I'm going to write it like this, z star over m quantity squared times p hat times 1 minus p hat. Now again, if you're in the planning stages of things, you haven't actually done any sampling, you're wondering how big should n be to get a specified margin of error. You don't know what p hat is, so you really can't use this formula as is. However, you can do one of two things. If you feel like you have a good guess <coughs> for p hat, for what p hat's going to be close to, based on past experience, you could put that guess in there and try using this formula. And you would get an answer. Would that answer be right? Would that give you the minimal value of n that gets you this margin of error? Not necessarily, because you're guessing p hat. What I almost always recommend is the play it safe formula, play it conservative formula. Again, it's not conservative versus liberal. It's conservative versus reckless. It's safe versus reckless in a statistical kind of way. Okay. What you can do to sort of play it safe is replace p hat 
with the, the thing that will make this quantity as big as possible, making n as big as possible from this formula. What value p hat will make that quantity as big as possible? It turns out if you put p hat equals 0.5, 1 half in there, that will make that as big as possible. If you want a quick reason, if you graph p hat times 1 minus p hat as a function of p hat, you get a parabola that's maximized with a vertex at 1 half. Usually, if you see this in a calculus or pre-calculus class, you use an x instead of a p hat. That's a quick brief reason why p hat equals 0.5 makes this quantity as big as possible. So if you do that, you get n equals z star over m squared times 1 half times 1 half. In other words, z star over 2m quantity squared. That's the conservative play it safe formula to get a minimal value of n that for sure will give you a margin of error less than 0 0.01. It might even be a lot less. If in reality, p hat's close to 0 or 1, for example. So in this problem, z star once again is 1.96. The m that we want here is going to be the 0 0.01. Just plug those two numbers into that formula to get something that will work. If m is 0 0.01, then 2m is 0 0.02. Do 1.96, divide by 0 0.02, square that number, and you get a sample size of 9,604. It's pretty big. Technically, if you want a margin of error, guaranteed to be 0 0.01 or less in any situation actually with the proportion. You can use that sample size. That's a pretty big sample size. It costs a lot of time and money. So usually people are okay with margins of error that are bigger than 1% for problems like this. But if you really had to have one and you weren't sure what p hat was or what p was, you'd have to use a sample size that big or bigger to really be absolutely confident. Third question. We're about out of time, but let's just look at it briefly. Do you have statistically significant evidence that the true population proportion is greater than 75%? <coughs> For Part C, technically you'd be doing hypothesis tests. The null hypothesis would be that P is 0.75, and the alternative would be that P is greater than 0.75. Now our confidence interval contains numbers that are all bigger than 0.75. We are 95% confident that the true value of P is in here. So in some sense, that is pretty strong evidence against this null hypothesis and in favor of the alternative. However, you've got to be careful because technically speaking, to use the confidence interval in the precise way where the alpha is 1 minus the confidence level as a decimal, like if, if the confidence level is 95% or 0.95, that means alpha is 0 0.05 or 5%. To truly reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level of significance, technically this would mean it need to be a two-tailed test. So this using of the confidence interval for a one-tailed test like this is not precisely what you want to do. It does seem to be some evidence against the null. But to truly understand what's going to go on with the right-tailed test here, you want to actually do it. Although, since the two-tailed p-value is double the one-tailed p-value, in fact, the one-tailed p-value would be smaller than 5% since this one's, because that doesn't contain 0.75, actually, we will work OK. So I'm kind of changing my mind there at the last second. Okay. The p-value would be even lower for a one-tailed test.
So if we were going to reject it for a two-tail test, we would also reject it for a one-tail test. I suppose you have to be more careful in the, in the situation where it does contain the null value. Okay? That's it for today.